Welcome to the 2Q 2020 conference call. My name is Erin and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you have a question, please press star then 1 on your touchtone phone. I'm now turning the call over to Maria Cuartas, Senior Analyst, Investor Relations. May we may begin. Thank you, Erin, and welcome everyone to Spirit Airlines' second quarter earnings call. This call is being recorded and simultaneously webcast. A replay of this call will be archived on our website for 60 days. Presenting on today's call are Ted Christie, a Spirit Chief Executive Officer, Scott Harrelson, a Chief Financial Officer, and Matt Klein, our Chief Commercial Officer. Also joining us on the call today are other members of our senior leadership team. Following our prepared remarks, there will be a question and answer session for sell-side analysts. Today's discussion contains forward-looking statements that are based on the company's current expectations, are not a guarantee of future performance, and are subject to risks and uncertainties. Factors that could cause actual resources to differ materially from those reflected by the forward-looking statements are included in our report on file with the SEC. We undertake no duty to update any forward-looking statements. In comparing results today, we will be adjusting all periods to exclude special items. Please refer to our second quarter 2020 earnings release, which is available on our website for the reconciliation of our known gap measures. Ted, I now turn the call over to you. Thanks, Maria, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I want to start by saying I'm very proud of how the entire SPIRIT team has responded to the changes driven by COVID-19. Many of our procedures, processes, and work environments have changed, all while our personal lives have been disrupted. Our team has done an incredible job adapting as necessary while maintaining their focus on delivering the best value in the sky. As we begin to welcome our guests back, we are taking purposeful steps to provide a safe and healthy experience for our guests and team members. We continue to expand and enhance our cleaning procedures. During the quarter, we launched antimicrobial fogging of our facilities and aircraft, which is effective against the coronavirus. This new process further improves upon our existing high-grade disinfectant fogging. In addition to these and other enhanced cleaning procedures, we are enforcing our policy that guests and team members must wear a mask while on board. These enhancements, coupled with the most advanced air handling and filtration systems on board any aircraft flying today, we believe create a safe and healthy environment for all. Financially, our top priority is to conserve cash and enhance our liquidity position. Given the significant decline in demand due to COVID-19, we dramatically reduced our flight schedule for the second quarter. During the month of April, we made several significant schedule cuts given the highly suppressed demand environment, operating only about 50 flights per day. In May, given the weak demand, we continued to operate this minimum schedule. We increased flying in June, as a result of encouraging, albeit tenuous, signs of demand rebounding. These favorable dynamics, our low cost structure, a relatively strong June, and an uptick in forward bookings for July resulted in favorable cash dynamics for the month of June. In connection with the finalization of our aircraft deferral agreement with Airbus, we also amended our 2018 PDP financing facility, extending the expiration date from December of this year to March of 2021. Due to deferring aircraft and amending this financing facility, in June, we made a principal payment of nearly $50 million. If not for this one-time principal payment, we would have achieved nearly zero average daily cash burn for the month of June. This, of course, doesn't mean we are through the worst of it. In fact, with the recent barrage of headlines regarding the increase in new coronavirus cases, coronavirus cases we've seen another setback in demand. We expect the rest of the summer to remain challenging for us and the industry. However, when demand for leisure travel rebounds and stabilizes, as evidenced by our June results, our leading low-cost structure positions us well to be among the first to return to profitability. With that, I'll turn it over to Scott to discuss more details of our quarterly performance. Thanks, Ted. I join Ted in thanking the entire Spirit team for helping us navigate through this crisis. The last few months have been challenging and our team's perseverance has been inspiring. To our financials, for the second quarter, our adjusted net loss was $286 million, or a loss of $3.59 per share. Adjusted operating expenses for the second quarter 
2020 decreased 43.3% year-over-year to $481 million. These changes were primarily driven by a 92.5% decrease in fuel expense and reductions in other flight volume-related expenses. Salaries, wages, and benefits expense was about flat compared to the same period last year, despite an 11.6% increase in our pilot and flight attendant workforce prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Enhancing and preserving liquidity remains the top priority. We ended the second quarter with $1.2 billion of unrestricted cash and short-term investments. During the second quarter, we completed a public offering of common stock, netting its proceeds of $192.4 million, completed a convertible debt offering, netting its proceeds of $168.3 million, and we increased our senior secure revolving credit facility from $110 million to $180 million, of which we drew the full $180 million during the second quarter. These transactions bring our total liquidity raised through financing transactions since the onset of the pandemic to over $540 million. And last night, we launched an at-the-money offering for 9 million shares of our common stock, which, if executed at yesterday's closing price, would yield about $150 million. In addition, we received proceeds from the payroll support program portion of the CARES Act for $301 million and expect to receive the remaining $33 million of proceeds before the end of July. We are pursuing additional financing for our unencumbered assets. We currently have traditional unencumbered assets that are valued at approximately $600 million and intangible assets such as our Free Spirit Loyalty and $9 Fair Club programs, as well as other brand-related assets that we believe could be used as collateral to raise significant additional proceeds. We have applied for a loan under the CARES Act Secured Loan Program. If approved, we are eligible for up to $741 million, and we have until September 30th to determine whether or not to participate. Regarding our fleet plan, we have reached agreement with Airbus to defer some of our 2020 and 2021 aircraft deliveries and corresponding pre-delivery deposits. For the remainder of this year, we will now only take three additional aircraft, bringing our total 2020 deliveries to 12 versus 16 previously. For 2021, we now have 16 aircraft scheduled for delivery versus 25 previously. You can find a copy of our updated fleet plan on our website. Of the three remaining deliveries this year, two will be debt financed, and the final delivery will be financed with a sale leaseback transaction. Ten of the 16 deliveries in 2021 are secured under direct lease arrangements, and we have not yet secured financing for the remaining six. We expect to use sale leaseback financing for these six aircraft, the first of which is not scheduled for delivery until June 2021. Total capital expenditures for this year are estimated to be approximately $560 million, or $215 million net of financing. The amounts not financed in this year are primarily related to pre-delivery deposit payments. For the remainder of the year, we estimate our capital expenditures will be $112 million, or $28 million net of financing. The majority of these expenditures are related to aircraft. As we progress through the second quarter, our cash burn declined primarily due to an improvement in net sales. We define average daily cash burn as the sum of operating cash flows, debt service, total capex net of financing, and pre-delivery deposit payments. It does not include the impact of any other financings, capital raises, or funds from the payroll support program. Our average daily cash burn trended from about $9.5 million in April to about $1.5 million in June. As Ted mentioned, our cash burn in June included a one-time principal payment of nearly $50 million related to an amendment of our PDP financing facility in conjunction with our Airbus aircraft deferral agreement. On our first quarter call back in early May, we previously got into cash burn levels of around $4 million per day for May and June. However, we ended up at just under $3 million per day for those two months, excluding the PDP facility payment, which was not contemplated in our $4 million per day estimate. Looking forward, based on current demand trends and the operation levels Matt will discuss, we estimate our average daily cash burn for the third quarter 2020 will range between $3 and $4 million per day. Before I close, I want to address the question as to how we can maintain our cost advantage in this environment. 
even if our utilization is temporarily lower than in previous years. Our cost advantage comes from four things. Higher utilization, a higher density seating configuration, more efficient fuel burn, and overall lower cost. In the end, the higher utilization has the smallest impact of the four, while our structurally low overall cost base is the largest contributor to that advantage. In fact, if we would have operated the daily utilization at the industry average of almost 11 hours per day in 2019, we would still have a chasm X of well under six cents. This is still half of the chasm X of the three largest carriers and 30 to 40% lower than the other lower cost airlines. Point being, our cost advantage is here to stay. All airlines are going to be facing short-term utilization reductions and it impacts everyone's cost structure. With that, here's Matt. Thanks, Scott. I also want to thank our SPIRIT team. Throughout the upheaval caused by the pandemic and economic crisis, our team has pulled together to support one another and the communities we serve. I'm inspired by our entire team and proud of everyone's dedication during this unprecedented time. As others in our industry have commented, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a material impact on travel demand. Our total operating revenue in the second quarter declined 86.3% year over year. As Ted and Scott both indicated, the demand environment has been volatile. Our flown load factor in April was 17.9% on a 76% reduction in year-over-year -year capacity. The May flown load factor was 65% on a nearly 94% reduction in capacity, and the June flown load factor reached 79.1% on a 79% reduction in capacity. We were very encouraged by the trends we were seeing for summer travel throughout the month of June. But unfortunately, as the headlines turned negative in mid-June regarding the increase of COVID-19 cases, demand for July pulled off a bit. Having said that, we anticipate July flown load factor will be in the low to mid 60s. We anticipated the recovery would be rocky and it certainly has been. On an ASM basis, July capacity is estimated to be down 18% year over year August down 35%, and September down 45% year over year. This equates to third quarter capacity being down 32% compared to the third quarter last year. International travel bans are still restricting us from serving many of our international destinations, but once the bans are lifted, it remains our intent to bring back service to all the destinations we served prior to COVID-19. In the international markets where we have reinstituted service, Visiting friends and relatives are a big part of the demand segment, and we expect it to be so with other destinations once they open. As such, we anticipate we will add back service to our VFR markets first and broaden our service as more tourism-oriented destinations come back online. The timing of stabilized demand recovery remains uncertain, but it will recover. The economy of the United States is resilient and has always bounced back stronger than it was before any previous crisis presented itself. Based on history, we believe price-sensitive travelers going to visit their friends and relatives will be among the first travel segments to rebound, followed closely by low-fare leisure travel. Both of these segments are core to our network, and we are in a great position to offer low fares and doing so at a profit. <clears throat> and now, I'll hand it back to Ted. Thanks, Matt. The continued health and economic crises that have caused unprecedented challenges on many fronts. Social unrest in our country is another challenge we must overcome. Now more than ever, we need to unite as a country and stand together against racism and bigotry of any kind. At Spirit, we celebrate our differences and know that we are stronger together because of them. Despite these challenges, our team has remained dedicated to provide excellent service to our guests and each other and to offer compassion for those around us. I am humbled and encouraged by the heart of the SPIRIT team. In times of economic and societal crisis such as this, the power of travel and human connection is ever more needed. In any macro setup, fares are the single most important component of anyone's air travel selection. And the simple truth is that SPIRIT is best suited to carry plane loads of low fares as our cost structure and network construction give us the tools to do so in a profitable and sustainable way. Nothing precludes any carrier from offering low fares. However, only a low-cost airline can do so and win. History has shown in a multitude of past recessions that low-cost airlines outperform the market. 
Some have questioned the sustainability of the low-cost model, be it because of utilization, density, or lack of hubs. The facts and economic realities favor our model during periods such as this. Discussions about market share, marginal cost, and hub economics are irrelevant to our business model. We will selectively deploy our assets in ways that we believe drive the best possible return, get us through cash neutrality, and on our way back to profitability. While it's anyone's guess as to when demand will return to normal, one thing is very clear. The margin of travelers needed for Spirit to achieve these goals is significantly narrower than it is for any other airline. With that, back to Maria. Thank you. We're now ready to take questions from the analysts. We ask that you limit yourself to one question with one related follow-up. Erin, we're ready to begin. If you have a question, please press star then 1 on your touchtone phone, or if you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. There will be a delay before the first question is announced, and if you're using a speaker phone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, that is star then 1 on your touchtone phone if you have a question. And your first question comes from Savi Syke. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I wonder if you could provide a little color. I appreciate you know, the, the, the trends have maybe flattened out or, or reversed, but could you help us understand just how the year-over-year kind of net revenue can pro progressed uh, and, and kind of what your expectations would be, especially given the noise around seasonality? Um, sure. Why don't I introduce, and, and Matt can jump in here as well. So um, as we indicated in, in the second quarter, um, you know, revenue really began to move in a positive direction relative to our size, of course, um, throughout the, the later part of May and into June, and we added capacity um, into the summer period as a reaction to that. Um, once we head into the fall, um, it's a seasonally off-peak period of time. And I think it's fair to say September and October are going to be very off-peak this period. So I think you would expect that year-over-year um, -year revenues would be challenged in that period of time when compared to the, ex to the experience we had thus far for um, the latter part of the second quarter and into the early part of July. Um, but, Matt, you want to give any more specifics? Uh, I, I think, Savi, as, as we think about um, the progression through the summer, um, I, I think it's important to note that the peak periods have performed relatively well. Again, this is all on a relative basis, of course. The July 4th holiday was strong. Uh, there's a lot of travel demand out there. Uh, our, I think evidenced by what we're gonna do from a load factor perspective in the month of July <clears throat> still speaks to demand is out there. Uh, what, we're, what we're being very aware of and uh, recognize is that as we get out of the summer into the fall, uh, traditionally off-peak periods will continue, continue to be traditionally off-peak. So um, we're expecting there to be a normal progression, probably a little more exaggerated this year for obvious reasons. And then we're just thinking about how we prepare ourselves uh, as we head through um, September and into the fourth quarter and then hit the holiday periods again at the end of this year. So a little bit of a, I'm not going to give you exact numbers on how the revenue is progressing through the summer into the fall, but that's kind of the way that we're, that we're thinking about off-peak periods heading back into peak periods. That, that's actually still helpful. Thank you. And then on, just on the cost trend, I'm kind of curious now that you're pulling down capacity again uh, in, into the third quarter, but still above kind of the second quarter, just should we assume kind of a lower year-over-year -year declines, or is, is there anything else that we should consider as, as you know, further cost actions are taken? Hey, Savvy, this is Scott. Um, yeah, I think when you think about the third quarter OPEX, um, we're probably going to be in a range of 670 to 680 million dollars of OPEX expense. That includes um, about 80 million gallons at a dollar 26. Um, as compared to our 480 million of op expense in Q2, um, so I think you can think about it that way. That's super helpful. Thank you. And your next question comes from Mike Lenningberg. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everybody. I guess um, two questions here, um, really, to Scott. Um, the way the you know the your loan program under the CARES Act, the 741 million. The way it reads in the release, it, it does sound like that, you know, 
it's up to 741 and the actual loan may be actually less than that. And I'm just curious, you highlighted 600 million of unencumbered traditional collateral that could be pledged. And then you highlighted some other items without a monetary amount. You know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, um, but does it suggest that maybe you, you wouldn't have enough collateral to back the 741 or maybe it would uh, require almost all of your collateral that you have, both traditional and non-traditional. Um, I, I don't have a sense of what the potential LTV is. Can you can you just um, you know add some color to that on, on that 741 and, and whether or not you have a sizable collateral pool to back that? Yeah, we can do that. Um, so I think for the government loan, we're targeting to use our intangible assets. So, so that's the loyalty program and the nine dollar fair club, um, and we expect that we're going to be pretty close to. Um, to the value that's needed for the government loan. We're still in the process of finalizing the valuation and and how the, the government would, would take those assets. Um, but we, we do expect we'd have enough um, to cover the loan if we wanted to do that, to not require oh. any you know, other tangible assets. Oh, that's, that's actually great color. Thanks, Scott. And then just actually my second question, and again, back to you. When I think about your ATL, so from the March quarter to the June quarter, it moved from 411 million to 452 million. And that makes sense when you think about, you know, what your, you know, your future sales are as you head into a peak period. How about, as we think about the split though, you know, call it, you know, traditional, you know, tickets that, that are on the books um, that have been purchased, versus, you know, what is potential refunds. Did that split change all that much from March to June? You know, I don't know if it's like a one third, two thirds, you know, carriers have sort of, you know, the demarcation seems to be split along those lines. I'm just curious if there was a shift or if it was um, what you saw at June quarter and uh, still very similar to what you were seeing at March quarter end. Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah, Michael, the, the, the ATL balance did grow um, and also our it as well. So with a $450 plus million dollar ATL, our credit shell balance is, is just shy of $250 million. Um, okay. So it comprises a, a pretty good chunk of the ATL. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's probably the way you should think about it. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Andrew, next question comes from Brandon Ognensky. Your line is open. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for taking my question. Um, Ted, I think given that you announced the uh, order book restructuring, you know, can you give us any insight into how you're thinking about 2021 or even the normalized period? I mean, how fast do you want to resume growth, and do you think you could even do it before we get, like, a vaccine out here for this virus, as some of your other competitors have highlighted that, you know, maybe demand won't come back until we have that outcome? Hey, Brandon. Um, sure. So obviously we, we worked, um, Scott and the team worked closely with Airbus to create a little bit more breathing room for us with regard to the order book. But um, another component of our fleet that remains, that is that is that exists today, that is a somewhat, you know, we've described it as kind of a, a swing component of our fleet is the um, entirely owned uh, 319 fleet, which is, you know, somewhere between 25 and 30 airplanes. It's in that ballpark. Um, and, and we reserve the right to use those airplanes or not at any given point, either at a, at regular utilization, lower utilization, or not at all. And so the, the work we did with Airbus gives us, um, um, a decent amount of breathing room with regard to deliveries, CapEx, and also flexibility as re relates to timing the recovery. And then, the additional shock, shock absorber is using those other aircraft um, uh, to, to help us time it a little bit better. The, the, the core of your question, which is what is, the, what is our expectation and when will we time the recovery? Unfortunately, I don't have any fresh information on that that, that would help you, but you know, we're, we are using the real-time information that we're seeing today to help guide our views on what the fourth quarter peak will look like, what will look like heading into the spring of next year. It is our expectation, by the way, that the company will resume its growth, that as Matt mentioned, eventually the, the economy will recover, leisure travelers are returning to the market already, and we expect that that will, will continue. It's going to be bumpy. And so navigating that window of time is really the crux of the issue. And Spirit is assembling a level of resources to be able to do that with fleet flexibility, with um, deferral rights, and making sure that we have the appropriate 
um, capital on board to, to navigate it. So um, I, I don't have a, a definitive date as to when we expect that to happen um, because we're digesting real-time information, but I think we have created enough flexibility to be able to do it when it happens. Well, appreciate that response, Ted. And I, I guess this question can be difficult to answer, but you know, is this a situation where you got to build it and they will come, or, or how do you manage capacity in this environment? Do you wait to see the bookings and then add to the schedule? You know, help us out for folks that don't run an airline. Yeah. Well, it's 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 a great question, and we mentioned this on our May call that we were not intending to lead the uh, lead the recovery. We were going to evaluate the market, see where demand recovers, and then deploy into it, which is exactly what we did in June and July. Um, and I think that worked well for us. Um, if you've seen from our forward schedules, we are removing capacity versus the peak in July as we head into August and September. And I think that shouldn't shock anybody because. It is, as Matt mentioned, it is an off-peak period, and we don't intend to try to drag the market to recovery. We're going to evaluate it, and that will mean we're going to have to, um, um, you know, continue to move the network in and out, uh, depending on the seasonality and the pace of the recovery. So, um, to those that don't run an airline, it's a, you know, it's treacherous, um, but I, I do feel. Uh, pretty good about our ability to use the assets we have to navigate within that window. Timing it perfectly is anybody's guess, um, but our focus on um, on seasonality, uh, network flexibility, and cost structure we think sets us up to be able to navigate it. Uh, and that that's kind of where we've been driving the network over the last 45 to 60 days. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, your next question comes from Jamie Baker. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so a question may, that, that may not be answerable, just given how choppy demand trends are, if you were to characterize how your competition is behaving in your markets uh, relative to, say, the fourth quarter of last year, would you characterize competition as more aggressive, less aggressive, or the same? Or impossible to tell. <laughs> hey, Jamie. Good morning. Um, it's Ted. Um, so, um, when compared to a normalized period, you're right. It's it's impossible to tell because I think okay. demand trends choppy. I think that the uh, the capacity movements across the various um, airlines are 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 different, um, and 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 um, individual strategies around which type of traffic to target and that sort of thing. Those are all not normal today. Hmm. So I, th I think it's impossible to kind of characterize it. Um, what I will say is that um, uh, our activity in June and July has reinforced that um, that low fares can bring back activity. And, um, and you know, as the, the, uh, the kind of media market and, and the news cycle in late May and early June began to turn more favorable, and we were looking towards a relaxation of restriction, leisure travelers were like a coiled spring. They were ready yeah. to come back low fares, okay? And admittedly, that has hit another bump in the road here because the news cycle has gone the other way. The numbers clearly in our home state of Florida are not encouraging. And, and as you know, our network is largely Florida. We have, you know, 45 to 50% of the, of the network touches Florida. Mm -hmm. And so even specifically to us, we probably have, um, you know, a little bit more of a challenge right now as Florida navigates its issue. But what's been encouraging over the last 60 days is seeing how people react when the news starts to get more favorable and the information starts to become more favorable. And that's where we think we're going to be ready to, to, to deploy, okay? It's navigating the window of time in the middle there that, that becomes the challenge. Got it. That's helpful. And there's a follow-up, and uh, again, this may also be, Difficult to measure, but uh, are you seeing any demand difference based on uh, stage length? I realize you don't obviously don't have you know truly long haul flying, but you know any interesting leisure patterns out there? For example, you know consumers are totally willing to spend ninety minutes on a Spirit aircraft, but longer flights. You're seeing different demand trends. Anything like that? Hey Jamie, it's Matt. I'll take that one. I would basically say uh, the law of supply and demand continues to hold. 
uh, is probably the best way to say it. When 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 we see opportunity um, to to attract that kind of traveler, uh, the leisure traveler, then it doesn't really seem to matter uh, where they're going. If we have the right the right price and the right schedule at the right time for them, uh, then we're seeing then we're seeing ridership. Okay. Uh, um, I would tell you that heading in, I'd say back in April, May, um, was operating under the thought that, that you're bringing up, which is the further the flight, the less likely a, a, a guest may be willing to sit on any aircraft, no matter whose mm -hmm. product it is. That doesn't really seem to be the case. It really seems to be where there's pockets of strength and there's demand for that, for that kind of travel, uh, leisure travel, then it, it doesn't seem to reflect the length of the haul relative to the ridership. That's great. Thanks for taking my admittedly wonky questions. Appreciate it. No problem. And your next question comes from Jan McKenzie. Your line is open. Well, hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, a couple questions here. You know, Matt, Florida, uh, state of Florida, 45 to 50% of the network. Um, I know Texas and California are bigger markets for you guys as well. Has there been a difference in demand progression in the COVID hotspot states, if you will, <clears throat> pardon me, versus the, the rest of the network? And I guess I'm just wondering how that's impacting or, um, or, or how that's affecting how you're optimizing the schedules um, as we head into the fall. Yeah, certainly. So we are taking, as Ted mentioned, we're taking in real time all the information that we can from various states um, and, and applying that to our thought process. Back, back when things first started and uh, things started to pop up in the New York metro area uh, relatively quickly, we basically um, stopped flying to the New York metro area for a period of time. Uh, based on that information, that was sort of at the outset of of, of the, um, the outbreaks earlier. Uh, as as that got better, we added more service back into the New York metro area. As we're seeing um, impacts from headlines, uh, which are legitimate, obviously, from what's happening with case counts, some leisure-oriented destinations are being impacted, and that has a direct impact on on demand. Uh, we have a relatively large presence in Myrtle Beach. And Myrtle Beach, for example, has had some negative news, and then you see uh, bookings relatively quickly kind of tail off. And there's an impact with cancellations as well. So as the, as the headlines move around the country, then you start to see uh, cancellations pop up and a lack and a reduction in gross demand at the same time. We're not going to be immune to that. That's happening to every airline uh, across across the country. Right now, we do feel like there is some geographic impact to us that – on a mix of the network basis, we're probably feeling more than others, uh, but we also anticipate that will start to change as as things then end up changing across the country. We're, we have some presence in California, but we're not a major player in, in California. That may impact airlines really, really soon that are bigger players in California. So we expect it's going to be a little bit of squeezing the balloon until everything is under control um, as the months progress. Mm, understood. Okay. Um, and then second question here, a balance sheet roadmap question. Um, you know, Scott, I'm wondering what the balance sheet looks like exactly at the end of the year um, in terms of, of debt, just based on, you know, how you're thinking about what you're going to need to, to raise in terms of additional liquidity here. And then what is the year-end liquidity target that you're, um, that you're shooting for? Hey, Dan. Um, so we'll start with cash, because uh, that may lead into some of the, de the debt discussions. So we're not going to give a, a, a full year target or um, any guidance on, on the balance, but, but what I can do is probably walk you through some of the math of how that may play out. Um, I mean, we start today with a $1.2 billion cash balance, and, you know, we have an ATM in the marketplace that, that you can you can take a guesstimate on, you know, how much we take of that in the year. Um, we have the, the government loan or, or some type of program where we use the, the – um, Frequent Flyer Program and $9 Fair Club is collateral, um, so you could take a guesstimate on on how much we could take from there. There's other CARES Act benefits, um, and then that sort of gives you your pro forma cash balance. And then you know we've given guidance on cash burn of three to four million for the third quarter. Um, you could probably expect the fourth quarter directionally to be a little bit better than that. Um, we're not going to give a, a number because we're not sure where that's going to play out, but directionally a little bit better. Um, so that that could get you to sort of a year-end cash balance that we're looking at, um, or at least a ballpark. Um, and then of that, 
you know, from a leverage perspective, you know, we haven't added um, a ton of debt so far. Uh, really, the revolver has been the big component um, and a little bit of the, the government uh, payroll support program. Uh, but we are going to lever up a bit, um, you know, in the back half of the year, either in the form of the government loan uh, or some type of program where we use the intangible assets. So um, the lever is going to move up. Um, there's just no way around it. Mm, understood. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. And your next question in queue comes from Dwayne Fenningworth. Your line is open. Hey, thanks. Um, just wanted to check my understanding of, of your definition of cash burn. It's not a it's not a spirit question because these these definitions are all over the map. But um, if your 2021 capex is in the range of say 700 million, but it's 100% financed. Uh, that would not impact your cash burn. So, in other words, you could get to cash flow break even, but the balance sheet could still be expanding. Yeah, Dwayne, the it's, it's net of financing. Um, so, if we were to lease one hundred percent of the aircraft we took, um, then that would have basically zero cost from a, a capex perspective, or from a cash burn okay. perspective. Okay. Okay, that that's consistent. And then. Um, not sure if you have it offhand, but can you give us breakage revenue for all of last year? We got we got the first half uh, with the disclosures last night. I wonder if you had that for for all of 2019. Dwayne, I do not have that on hand. Uh, we can we can see if we can compile something there. I don't know if we disclose full breakage for for 2019, but we can we can take a look. Okay. And then just just on demand, kind of big picture, and, and forgive me if you've said this already, but you know there's some industry peers that have talked about demand in the kind of 20 to 25 percent of of 2019 levels over the summer. Is that how you're seeing it also? Uh, Dwayne, this is this is Matt. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the reference is that some of the competitors um, are are talking about, but in terms of uh, how, how we think about overall demand. We also had a question earlier. I want to add to this that Savi asked at the very beginning about revenue. Um, we are prepared to talk about that in the third quarter, capacity will be down 32%, as we had mentioned earlier, and we're expecting a revenue outcome year over year to be down about 65%. So revenue down 65% year over year uh, relative to the 32% reduction in in capacity for the third quarter. Um, so okay. I don't know if that I don't know if that helps add color to your question there, Dwayne. Or not. That, that that's it. Sorry, sorry to have you repeat it. I, I appreciate uh, appreciate the answer. Very clear. Yep, no problem. Thanks. And your next question comes from Joe Chiato. Your line's open. Hey, thanks very much. Good morning. Um, my first question is a, a strategic one for, for Ted or Matt, whoever wants it. Uh, I'm curious if the current crisis presents a sort of a hidden opportunity for Spirit to actually go and seek out um, new strategic airport partners, whether that's in, in the domestic market or, or near field international destinations, just airports that can offer attractive fees or terms to attract Spirit to those airports, sort of help them stimulate demand and support the economic recovery when it does pick up again. Or, is, I mean, is that something that's that you'd even consider doing right now, maybe going out with RFPs to position for when things normalize, or is that something like that just very back of mind during a time like this? Well, clearly what's front of mind, thanks for the question, Joe. Um, what's front of mind, obviously, is navigating the crisis right now, focusing on liquidity, cash burn, um, using the network to enhance those types of things. But with that said, um, as we, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, we expect that as the economy begins to recover, that our travel segment will be um, leading that, and we we believe that Spirit will be at the front end of it um, of that travel segment. So, evaluating our opportunities throughout the course of this crisis, while not the first thing that I wake up and think about in the morning and the last thing I think about at night, is is um, a component of it. And um, and so, you know, we we um, we expect the business, the broad, broadly the industries. Uh, you know, speaking broadly, will get smaller. Um, and with that, we believe there will be opportunity. And so thinking about how to um, uh, to pursue that is is one of our projects. Again, not the first one, um, but 
but something that we, we think we can do, whether or not it's um, exploring unique airport partnerships or expanding in areas that were previously difficult for us to, uh, to gain access, um, or looking at our existing franchises, the way we fly today, be it in large leisure destinations or even international, and are there ways for us to capitalize upon our geography, quite frankly. So, um, so I think those are all on the list. Uh, and we expect, as as recovery happens, that they will materialize. Right, right. Okay, thanks, Ted. Uh, my second question, uh, very quick one, just an apology if I missed it. What's your latest thinking on the need for layoffs or furloughs in the fourth quarter after after the, the peril funding expires? Um, sure. So uh, there is obviously a bright line date at September 30th right now where the CARES Act um, uh, covenant does expire. We are still in fluid uh, evaluation as to um, uh, what we think we would need to do. Uh, I mentioned that, you know, uh, as we talked about this kind of like the period of time that we're attempting to navigate until the the leisure uh, segment begins to recover, how do we do so? And, um, and included in that could be right-sizing of fleet um, and or right-sizing of other fixed-related expenses and that sort of thing. We are in regular discussions with our organized work groups, and they have actively been taking voluntary action to provide the company with flexibility. Thousands of employees accepting um, voluntary um, leaves that help uh, that help us uh, navigate the crisis uh, and reduce fixed expense. And so, um, so while those are on the table, you know, we continue to look at ways to. Um, to mitigate the need for an involuntary action post September 30th. Um, but right now, I think we're still reading the game film, to be honest, because um, you know, the summer has been up and down both sides, and we want to make sure that we, that we digest all the information before we make a call. Being small, being a little bit more nimble, being a single fleet type allows us to do that a little bit closer in than I think you're seeing from larger airlines. Got it. Thanks, Ted. And your next question is from Hunter K. Your line is open. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Hunter. Um, Scott, what would your daily cash burn be, say, with like a three-month lead time if you had to take your capacity growth rate down to zero? Well, we've generally talked about sort of the baseline cash burn uh, for the business at, at today's levels of fleet uh, would be around $4 million a day um, so that we could – you know, we've talked about a fixed variable component, so, you know, we'd be about half of our um, operating expense. So I think that that's probably okay. a good number. Cool. That's very helpful. Thanks a lot. And then um, you talked about utilization being down. You, I think you've referred twice to it as being temporary or short-term. So what what is the lag between the time when you actually hit your pre-COVID capacity levels and when you hit your pre-COVID utilization levels? Like, I guess what happens first and, you know, is there a big gap between those two things occurring? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead. I'll, I'll try first, Hunter, because um, it's, it's an interesting topic um, because threaded into your question is how long is the, uh, the period of time that we've been discussing this whole call? Like how long is the, the kind of, the slower part of the recovery, which we're just not sure about. So, in, in well, Ted, I'll just it, it's Ted. It's really a cost question, not so much a demand question. Just so I'm clear, you know what I mean? I, I'm really it, it's it's it, it's not. I'm not really asking about like your view on when demand recovers. Just just so we're clear, you, you know what I mean? Um, it's about the utilization lag when you can get back to that 12.3 hours per day. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to just clarify. Okay. Um, sorry, I interpreted it. You would have the utilization go up when the demand recovers. But um, you, you said the 12.2 or 12.3 yeah. versus 2019 capacity. I mean, I yeah, that's yeah, it's just that's right. It's just yeah. What happens first? You, you hit 2019 capacity on an ASM basis, or you hit the 12.3 hours per day first? Yeah. And, and maybe that is a demand question. It wasn't intended to be in one though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the fleet's moved since 2019. Obviously, we've taken deliveries, so. Um, to get to 2019 ASMs, we can have lower utilization. Right. right. With, and the only thing I'd add, because I was going to get to it, is that to the extent that we decide to keep all the airplanes, utilization right. would be 
um, would 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 lag the ASM production because we are bigger to the extent we decide to keep all the airplanes. And that's the when I said navigating the period of time by which we we believe we're in this down, um, still in the shoulder part of this down. Um, would would guide our decision on whether or not that's true, and we haven't yet made that call. But um, but that those that, those are the working parts. It's the fleet count and and the return to demand. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. And your next question comes from Helene Becker. Your line's open. Um, thanks very much, Operator. Hi, team, and thank you very much for the time. Um, I know I should probably know this, and I apologize that I don't. Do you um, own the land upon which you were going to build your headquarters building? And if so, would you consider selling it to get through this crisis before you know, pursuing it once we get back to some level of whatever is normal? Hey, Elaine. Uh, this is Scott. So, yes, we do own the Hi, land. Scott. Um, and so I, I don't think the decision um, to sell the land would be to generate cash. I think it's a, really a decision around what we think the future of that uh, facility is going to be. Um, so if we if we decided to continue down the path, obviously we wouldn't sell it. If we decided to change a plan, then then we could sell it. So I, I don't think it's for generation of cash. Okay. And then my other unrelated question is, you know, one of the things that's changed among some of your peer group is ancillary fees, and I'm kind of wondering what you're thinking about the future of those fees and how um, they're going to look, you know, once we get to, I don't know, some level where people are, are not afraid to fly again. Hi, Elaine. It's Matt. Uh, good morning. Hi, Matt. Uh, I, so what's, what's interesting is uh, right now in the environment we're in today, our – our uh, seat assignment charges and bag charges have been relatively stable once we got into a closer to somewhat normal situation that we're in now with demand, although it's nowhere near real normal, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, it, it, they're hanging in there, actually. So uh, th those charges seem, seem to be ones that's part of our model, it's quarter our model, and our, our uh, customers are continuing to act in a normal way there. If you're referencing, uh, say, change fees, if you mean that one overall, uh, that one is always up for for discussion. Um, and I think our perspective on that is we're going to have a structure out there that we think generates the most overall total revenue for us and still provide the services to, to, the, to the guests. So um, we're always in evaluation of all of our, all of our service charges so to the extent that we think a change would benefit the customer and benefit our revenue generation, then we would make a change. <clears throat> right now in the world we are in today, it's been relaxed. Uh, we do not anticipate it's going to be that way um, in the long-term future. It may still be relaxed for a period of time, but in the long run, we would expect things to come back to normal, uh, as we're already seeing with a number of our, of our charges today. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that's really very helpful. Um, thank you. Great. You're welcome. And your next question comes from Catherine O'Brien. Your line is open. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for the time. Um, just a couple on CapEx. First, so maybe first a clarification. Did your agreement with Airbus to defer aircraft end up resulting in a slightly larger reduction to 2020 CapEx than that 185 million target you called out last quarter? I think on my math, I was getting closer to 10, although there could be some other moving pieces there. And, and then in your 10Q, you have air cap, cap, CapEx of 356 million for 2021, but you know, 16 aircraft scheduled for delivery, that seems a little low. Is there something else being netted against that? I guess just, you know, probably bigger picture question, you know, how should we be thinking about 2021 CapEx in total? Thanks. Yeah, hey, Catherine. Um, so from the CapEx number uh, this year, really I think the one of the components is the net of PDPs. Um, so if you net the PDPs, you know, for this year, um, we expect to have about $80 million-ish remaining of CapEx this year, um, so maybe that, that's the difference in your, your 2020. 
Um, in 2021, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit different because the 16 deliveries that we have, 10 of those are direct operating leases from lessors that are not part of our order book. So the six that we have from Airbus during 2021 are really the capbacks of what you're trying to think about. Okay, got it. And then anything on the non-aircraft side we should be thinking about for 2021? Uh, for, for the remainder of this year, we've said, you know, around 30, a little more than $30 million of non-aircraft capex. Um, we haven't um, thought about 2021 yet. Um, so you could use a barometer of, of 2019 or 2020 um, as, a, as a guesstimate for 2021, but we haven't done our, our capex plan for next year yet. Okay, great. If I could sneak maybe just one quick uh, more fleet one in. Um, I know I know you just noted that your decision on, you know, how big the fleet is going forward will be demand dependent, but can you just help us think through what flex you have in the event you did want to get to a smaller fleet? You know, is it is it just that 20 to 25 A319 own fleet you mentioned earlier, or should we also be thinking about lease returns? And uh, thanks again for all the time. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, thanks for the question. So um, I think the, as I alluded to, you know, those those 319s that we own are the are the natural first step um, beyond utilization, of course. Um, so if you're just talking about fleet, um, they're they're a zero cash burden airplane today, so they can they can be partially used, they can be parked, or they can be retired. And there's 25 of those aircraft um, in the fleet today. Um, so that's going to be which which for the size of the airline we are is actually a sizable percentage um, uh, of, of our yeah. total fleet. So I think that's the biggest component. Lease returns, we don't have any scheduled lease returns in the near term here. Um, so I think, you know, we'd really be focused on this subfleet of aircraft first. Yeah, so to, to finalize the point, we own about uh, 20, almost 20% 20 of our fleet unencumbered. It's the 25 319s and we have four A320s unencumbered as well. Um, and, and we don't have, like Ted said, we don't have a lease return until really the end of 2022. Um, so it's the unencumbered assets that give us the flexibility. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And your next question in queue comes from Joseph Denardes. Your line is open. Hey, uh, good morning. Um, Scott, I know the, the loyalty program and the co-brand uh, card Updating those were, were two initiatives, and I think maybe they've continued to progress through all this. Could you update us on on how that's going, and and what the nature of the conversation with with B of A has been? Are, are they approaching things differently given the environment, and how sensitive do you think the economics of your co-brand card are to, um, you know, potentially being smaller or or growing at a slower rate going forward? Thank you. Hey Joe, it's Matt. I'll, I'll take that question. Um, so I would I would characterize the discussions um, with Bank of America as extremely stable and and very productive. And uh, the reality of the situation is that due to everything going on right now, we've actually slowed some of our development um, on some on the program overall in terms of the technology perspective and getting things ready to go. So. Um, Long answer short, I think the relationship is great. Um, things have been approached about the same way, and really the pacing item is, is a lot of the IT work that we purposely slowed down right now, um, just while we're thinking about CapEx overall. But that's not an indication of our lack of desire to move it forward, and we will move it forward. The timeline just got pushed out a little bit due to everything going on right now. Got it. And then... Just in terms of maybe the, the demographic of your customers, can you just talk about maybe what, what portion of your customers are, are older just in light of COVID? Has, has that, did that shift as demand came back? And then have you learned anything in terms of what's effective marketing spend and what's not as you've, you know, kind of turned off and turned on the airline over the past few months? Thank you. Yes, sure thing, Joe. So um, I'm not going to get into the exact uh, percentages, but we do have a pretty good handle on the demographics of our of our customer base. What I will tell you, though, is directionally, uh, the the ages of of uh, people on the aircraft have come down uh, during the pandemic. So the the traveling consumer, on average, is becoming younger 
um, on board. And along those lines, also um, things like household income. I mean, we're, we're, we're tracking as much as we can, and some of those other components have changed around a little bit, um, as you'd expect with a younger, a younger um, average age. The household incomes come down a little bit um, with that as well. But we're, we're getting very good information. Uh, these days in terms of surveys, and as the pandemic has continued, we're actually getting better information. It seems like our guests are as willing, or in some cases more willing, to share their experiences with us. And uh, along those lines, the experiences have been, have been good. Our, our net promoter scores have, in fact, improved um, during during this period of time. So it just goes to show that continue, continuing to run a good operation matters and our guests are, are seeing that as well. Thank you. Absolutely. And your next question comes from Andrew. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Great. Um, so sorry if I missed this, or, uh, if I missed this earlier, but just trying to get a sense for like what type of revenue decline do you think you need to reach in order to be cash burn break even? Um, any sort of guide post you can give there. And I guess if you're uncomfortable giving a, a guide post looking forward, maybe give us a sense of where June revenues came in to achieve that sort of, uh, you know, cash burn break, break even number. Hey, Andrew, this is Scott. Um, that's an interesting question on the drop in revenue. I, the, the way that we sort of thought about it technically is, you know, look, e EBITDA margin is your, you know, sort of, um, you know, ongoing cash generation break even number. Um, so if you're at a 20% EBITDA margin, you can withstand a 20% reduction in revenue to be cash break even, you know, as an estimate. Um, so I think at, at, at any point below that number, um, if revenue declines greater than that number, you have to take a corresponding amount of fixed cost out of your business. Um, especially if you're going to operate um, a, a smaller amount of capacity. So um, difficult to say what, what that number would be, um, but I think, you know, from a longer-term perspective, you got to get EBITDA margin, you know, at zero. Be cash break even. And, and right. the, only thing we, the only thing we could add to that is our EBITDA margin going into the crisis was higher than, than the vast majority of the airlines. So as it returns, we expect that we will be the first one to generate cash. At what percentage of revenue is the trickier question, and it's hard to say that definitively without knowing whether you mean with a stable fare, with the same capacity deployment, all that sort of thing. Right, fair enough. Um, are you willing to give a June revenue number? You mean like revenue decline? Your revenue year? decline, yeah. June. Yeah, so I think um, we haven't given any monthly data that that uh, yet, um, Andrew. But um, one thing about you know cash neutrality in the month of June, obviously the way that we and other airlines have defined cash um, inflows and outflows is the sum of of bookings for forward period minus your cash expenses minus your your depreciation and all that, or your amortization of debt, all that other kind of stuff. So. The setup in June was pretty good because demand was definitely coming in for the month, um, and we were booking July, uh, which which all airlines were doing at the time. So I think what it, what's more important to to the analysis is the relative performance there, and it shows you that in a recovery, we're already going to be um, ahead uh, based on the return of the leisure traveler. Okay, got it. Uh, my other questions have been answered. Thanks a lot. You got it. And your final question comes from Daryl Genovese. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for the time. Good morning, um, Daryl. Scott, uh, you reduced your second quarter capacity by 83%, but your labor costs barely budged. I know you have this moratorium on furlough to deal with, but um, other carriers operating under the same restrictions were still able to take out 20 30% of their Q2 labor costs. So, was just hoping you could help us understand some of the moving pieces uh, beneath the surface, uh, beneath the surface on labor specifically. Um, I'll start. Scott can can yeah. jump in as well. So yeah, labor costs basically flat um, despite the fall in capacity. I think um, the the other input is that labor volume went up because we were a growth airline heading uh, heading into this period, so we had more 
had bodies on the property year over year than than we would have otherwise. So I think that's offsetting some of the benefit of the voluntary leave programs that we saw. And of course, those built throughout the quarter. So um, you didn't get a full run rate um, benefit in there. Um, and and you know we're not set up given given the company's opportunity to eventually. Uh, resume its growth profile and and um, and you know uh, go through the recovery as as leisure demand recovers. Um, we, we have to determine how much of this is permanent and how much of this is temporary. And um, and I think that um, uh, bigger carriers with more travel segments like long haul international and business travel being larger components of it are probably making the same decisions, but maybe on a more accelerated basis because it's a different market. Um, and so I think that could be also contributing to um, maybe what you're perceiving as a disconnect between where we are and someone else, Scott. Would yeah, say. great. So the, we, we increased, um, you know, total overhead, uh, total people, um, probably around 12% year over year. Um, and so that, that number is going to be, um, you know, a driver of the disconnect. You know, plus we had some moves that we made intra-quarter um, that we had to spend a little money on to buy us some flexibility. Um, that, that that did help us in other areas of the P and L. Um, so we were a little bit inflated um, in SWB in the second quarter, um, and and that shouldn't replicate itself in the third quarter. Can you say? Can you just say where you are um, relative to your minimums on hours? You mean from an average uh, crew member? Yeah, I guess so. That's probably the one that makes the most sense. Yeah, I mean, or, or, and and where do you think that goes? Uh, you know, and, and and maybe the exit rate would be good too. Yeah, I mean, obviously for um, for for the second quarter, we operated a minimal airline. Uh, we're going to be four times the size of that in the third quarter, um, so we'll approach minimums. But um, I would still estimate we'd be underneath. Okay. Them. okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes our call for today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.